Greetings, my name is Elizabeth Hoover. I'm an associate professor in the Environmental Science Policy and Management Department at UC Berkeley, and also on the executive committee of the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And today I'm presenting to you from Garden Warriors to Gastro Diplomacy, Farmers, Chefs, and Water Protectors Working Toward Food Sovereignty. So to start in thinking about what is food sovereignty and how are the indigenous folks that I'm gonna talk about thinking about this concept, um, we're gonna start with the term as developed by La Via Campesina, which is an international peasant organization that has worked with this term starting in the 1990s and really popularized the idea of food sovereignty. And as part of a gathering that they held in 2007, the definition that participants came up with was that food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy, culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. So this is a little different from the idea of food security, which ensures that people are getting enough calories into them and has been critiqued as, okay, if you're getting enough food consistently dropped to your community, then maybe you have food security, but you don't necessarily have um, the same level of control over how that food is produced. People who are advocating for food justice wanna make sure that there is equal access to safe, healthy food, wants assurances that the workers within the food system are treated fairly, and also um, seeks accounting for the value of food in relation to the self-determination of communities. Um, so this idea of equal access is a little different from food sovereignty. In many cases, activists are saying, we don't just want equality within the current system, but to have control over your own system. Indigenous food sovereignty kind of takes some of these definitions a step further and seeks to recognize the social, cultural, and economic relationships that underlying community food sharing and that need to be nurtured in order for a society to be healthy. Um, it also recognizes the sacred responsibilities to nurture those relationships to land-based food and political systems. And here, these are some students at the Uchi Language School in Oklahoma that are learning gardening as part of their cultural and language instruction. So why is it that indigenous communities are facing challenges to food sovereignty? Why is there a whole movement happening right now? This is sort of the whirlwind tour through the history of North America. It starts in many cases with scorched earth battle tactics. So on the East Coast, you know, this started with the French in the 17th century um, that burned Haudenosaunee or Iroquois cornfields as a way of weakening these nations politically. George Washington suggested a very similar tactic when he sent General Sullivan in the, as part of the, the Revolutionary War to lay waste to their settlements. And so Sullivan was instructed to go forth and soldiers burned millions of bushels of corn, many, many acres of corn, of fruit orchards, different crops were burned as a way of weakening Haudenosaunee communities that, that didn't join the Americans as part of the revolution. And further west, you had the intentional destruction of buffalo herds as part of um, pushing settlement west and as part of weakening and starving out tribes and forcing people onto reservations. For Navajo or Diné communities, um, people who did not immediately obey and head north to Bosque Redondo, Kit Carson and his men um, would slaughter the sheep and, and burn the fields, again, as a way of forcing people to comply or go hungry. There has been a long history of theft of land, of relocation, so the kind of most well-known being the Trail of Tears for tribes that were relocated from the southeast, the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Seminole, that were forced from the southeast out to Oklahoma, several other tribes around the country forced from their traditional homelands to Oklahoma and other territories. And if you've spent any time in South Carolina and in Oklahoma, you know that the landscapes are very different. Um, so that made it challenging for when people were resettled to then be able to feed their families the same way. Um, your seeds might not necessarily grow as well in these new places. The, the wild plants and animals are bound to be a little bit different. 
So even after people are relocated from their homelands um, into these new spaces, people are rounded up and put onto reservations. Those reservations on homelands are then further shrunk through legislation like the Dawes Act in 1887, which took community held land and divided it down into smaller parcels of individually held land. And then the extra land was then um, sold to settlers. And so this further diminishment of land base also made it more challenging for people to be able to feed themselves. The boarding school system forcibly rounded up kids from indigenous communities, sent them to schools where they were taught that the traditional ways of growing food, catching food were wrong and people were re-educated to do more Western styles of farming um, that in many cases didn't work as well in some of these homelands. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA, also promoted Western farming methods and using hybrid seeds. And in many places like uh, Hopi, Zuni, in the places in the Southwest where people had relied on dry land farming, um, some of these more Western styles of farming did not work as well in these landscapes. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, you had um, non-native collectors, seed breeders, ag companies that were collecting um, heirloom styles of you know, indigenous seeds um, that then went on to help ensure the success of those seed companies. Um, and in many cases, those tribal communities were then um, had hybrid seeds pushed on them. And so now many people are going back and we'll talk a little bit about this coming up. I'm trying to reclaim some of those heirloom seed varieties. For some you know, more contemporary challenges, you have climate change that's making it challenging um, for people to reclaim and plant heirloom seeds. Um, if your seeds are for a very particular type of setting, and you find yourself with um, some summers are very dry and some are very wet. Um, that's made it challenging to bring back some of these heirloom varieties. Cross-contamination with genetically modified seeds are a concern. So if you're trying to uh, plant heirloom corn and all of your neighbors around you are planting uh, genetically modified commodity corn, there's concerns about the pollen drifting in from those other crops. In some communities, people don't have access to the kind of land and tools and maybe even seed that they need to, to plant the amount of food that they would like. And some people I've talked to said, well, there's just not as much interest um, in gardening as there once was. And so there's been an effort to try to foster this in tribal communities. So what have been some of the impacts of um, all these different things that have led to changes in the food systems? Prior to 1940, there were very few cases of type two diabetes in native communities. And now it's the seventh leading cause of death for native people who are 249% more likely to die of diabetes related health complications than any other um, ethnic community. So there are the health impacts. There's also the economic impacts. So the White Earth Land Recovery Project a few years ago did a survey among their um, community members and found that people spend $8 million a year on food, 7 million of which was spent off reservation. And so the concern is how do you make sure some of those dollars are staying in the community among tribal food producers? So there's the, the grim statistics. There's some of the kind of grim and sad history, which I think is important to acknowledge as part of any of these issues, but we don't wanna get stuck there. We wanna make sure that we are also focusing on the fact that native people aren't just laying around waiting to die of all of these you know, health issues and uh, lack of access to the kind of food they might want, but people are working very hard to try to reclaim these food systems. And so I got interested in this topic while I was working with a group called Ganahio Yungwaya Dohage, or We Are Planting Good Seeds up in Akwazasni, which is a, a Mohawk community that uh, crosses the New York and Canadian border. And this organization was started as a way of trying to help people get back into farming and gardening and producing more food at home. Um, so as part of this, you know, working to, to help with chickens and greenhouses and corn picking, uh, we would often have these conversations of, well, how are other communities doing this kind of work? How are other Native communities trying to get people back into um, producing their own food? 
And so I was there in Okwazesni working on this book, The River is in Us, Fighting Toxics in a Mohawk Community, that looked at specifically the impact of environmental contamination on some of these issues and how people were then working to get the environment cleaned up, but also to um, get people back into eating local food. So as part of figuring out how do other communities work with this, um, I started attending a lot of different food sovereignty summits and meeting people from different tribal communities all over the country. And then in the summer of 2014, I jumped in the car and drove 20,000 miles around the country over about four months and stopped into 40 different communities and talked to people about how are you through these community-based farming and gardening projects, getting people back into eating local food. So I started this blog from Garden Warriors to Good Seeds, Indigenizing the Local Food Movement, because um, you know, the publishing process takes a very long time. I'm still working on this book manuscript, hopefully gonna get done very soon. Um, but people wanted to know what are other communities doing? Um, how are other people addressing these issues? Um, how you know, can they see what people are working on? Um, so this blog was meant as a way of, of sharing what I was learning about each of the different projects. So some of the different questions that I was asking the, the members of these different community groups um, was how the organizations got started, what are some of the successes and challenges, how do you define food sovereignty, how do you decide what qualifies as an indigenous or heritage or heirloom seed for your community, where do you get your funding, um, do you see yourself as part of the broader food movement? And what kind of recommendations do you have for other communities trying to start a project like this? So the, the question of how do you define food sovereignty? I published an article in the American Indian Culture and Research Journal called You Can't Say You're Sovereign If You Can't Feed Yourself, Defining and Enacting Food Sovereignty in American Indian Community Gardening that addressed um, some of these different definitions that people were giving me around food sovereignty. And some of the themes that came out of that where people were really focused on the restoration of health, both on a physical level, you know, addressing some of those uh, metabolic disorder statistics that we talked about earlier, on a cultural level, so recognizing that bringing back um, language programs and ceremonies are also connected to um, res restoration of traditional food and spiritual health. Um, there was a focus on making sure the community had access to culturally appropriate food specifically. So it wasn't just about like how much kale can we grow and get onto everybody's plates, but specifically, you know, how much of the kind of cultural foods that people need um, can be produced within the community. And there was a real focus on relationships. So between people and each other as part of working on these projects, between people and the land and people and the food and thinking about community in different ways. So not just um, community as in the group of people you hang out with, but what are your relationships between um, humans and plant communities and bird communities and fish communities. And then also thinking about um, levels of control over what you're eating, what's going into your body as an individual. Um, the, on a community level, are people getting enough access to food? And then on a tribal self-sufficiency level, uh, economic independence, so hearkening back to that survey that was done by the Wire Land Recovery Project, thinking about how do you keep your food dollars within the community? How do you make sure that you're not completely reliant on outside entities for your food? Or making sure people have enough access and a real focus on education, so working to make sure that people were aware of why it was important to eat these traditional foods. And because I was focused specifically on um, community-based farming and gardening projects, recognizing that the food sovereignty movement is much broader than that. Um, you know, there are people that are focused on hunting rights and fishing and foraging. Um, but because I was focused specifically on farming and gardening projects, thinking about the continuing and revitalizing the use of traditional heirloom seeds as part of this work. Um, so seed sovereignty is the right of farmers to save, use, exchange, and sell farm saved seed, and having that be valued over the plant breeders and agrochemical firms' intellectual property rights. So how are we ensuring that people within communities um, have full control over what's happening with the seeds from those communities? And so when I 
talked to different seed savers as part of this project and asked them, how do you find food sovereignty or how do you find seed sovereignty as a particular part of food sovereignty? Uh, this is Clayton Brockope, who uh, founded the Traditional Native American Farmers Association. And he talked about protecting our living relatives so that they can't be molested, contaminated, or imprisoned. And he said, well, what I mean by molested is if somebody wants to genetically tinker with your seeds, um, he considered that really kind of an abhorrent thing to do. Contaminated, if somebody's pollen is blowing in from other fields, it's going to you know, contaminate the, the genetics of your heirloom crops. Um, or imprisoned, he said, if somebody patents your seeds, you can't exchange them in the same way. Um, they're sort of imprisoned, they're, they're kept from you. And he described the inherent right to save seed and pass it on to future generations. And then Rowan White is another Mohawk seed keeper. She helps to run the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network and the Sierra Seed Exchange. And she described, um, you know, in defining seed sovereignty, the ability to define our relationship to that seed based on our own values and not on the values of anyone else outside of our community. So the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network is a project out of the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. And the purpose of this organization is to help Indigenous communities all over the country to develop seed keeping networks, to develop the kind of skills that people need to garden specifically for the purposes of seed saving. So you see here Zach giving a workshop on hand pollination to ensure that that corn um, is not mixing with other corns, having seed exchanges to make sure that people have access to the kind of seed and that seed is moving through different communities to keep it kind of robust genetically. So when I ask people, you know, how do you decide what qualifies as a heritage seed or an heirloom seed or an indigenous seed for your community? Um, you know, people say, well, it's, it's been passed down through families oftentimes, and that's how they know that it's from their community specifically. There are specific songs and ceremonies that are done for those seeds. So, for example, um, one fellow that I talked to said, well, look, you know, this organization over here collected our seeds without chatting with us, put them in their seed bank, and they grow them out periodically, but they're not singing and they're not performing the ceremonies for them. So I don't think they can call them our seeds anymore. They're having a very different upbringing and experience than our seeds with. Um, for other people, you know, it's just important, even if those seeds from their community came from seed banks or came from other institutions, that, you know, doing the research and discovering what seeds their ancestors ate was important to bring those seeds home, even if they've been away for a while, um, because the genes in those seeds connect them to their ancestors. So in thinking about this handful of corn that she's got here, all of those colors, the texture, the flavor, the length of the cob, the height of the plant, the ability to grow specifically, in this case, way up north, um, that was all determined because of choices made by generations of seed keepers. And so by being able to bring those seeds home and continue to plant those seeds, you're reconnecting with those different generations of seed keeper. And thinking about how the, you know, these shouldn't be static. So, you know, some people said, well, we have to allow ourselves each year to choose in deciding which seed to save for the next year, to choose the ones that are growing the best now in our current setting, the ones that taste the best to us now. So some communities were really working to try to preserve seed exactly as it was and exactly as they inherited it. And others were saying, well, we need to be able to um, make sure that that's not too static so that the seed will do well and people will want to eat it. So why is it important to plant and save heritage seeds? Um, people talked about having these cultural connections to planting that are established when you're putting that corn, in this case, um, the Dream of Wild Health Project in Minnesota, Dakota Flint corn that is now being reunited with Dakota homeland. And so for the youth, like Elijah here, that were part of this project, they got to establish that cultural connection to the seed, to the land, to the food that they were eating. Um, often there's a ceremonial context, so there's specific foods that are required for ceremonies that you need to be able to continue planting these heirloom seeds to still have access to that food. Um, Re-establishing connections to ancestors by planting the seeds that your ancestors planted and ate and lived off of. 
And there's also a sense that these were more nutritious than the types of seeds that you're getting from the industrial agriculture machine. So, you know, going to, to Walmart or Agway or Home Depot and buying those seeds, people felt that the heirloom seeds were going to be more nutritious. And so part of the process of trying to get some of these seeds back into people's gardens, back into their home communities is through the process of seed rematriation. So many of you have probably been familiar with the term repatriation, which is usually used to talk about bringing home prisoners of war back to their home country, or in the case of NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, bringing home ancestral remains and sacred objects back to their tribal nation. And it's sort of a one-way process. It's taking things that never should have been taken from the community and bringing them back to their home nation. Uh, the term rematriation was developed as a way of first honoring the, the women seed keepers. So repatriation sounded a bit patriarchal. So the essence was, okay, how do we um, make this a term that recognizes the importance of all those grandmas who saved that seed and are fighting to bring that seed home. But it's a much more circular process. So it's reconnecting indigenous people to those seeds that have often been taken out of the community, reconnecting those seeds back to the land from which they were developed, and then in the process, reconnecting indigenous people and land. And so this photo here is from um, a food sovereignty summit that happened in Taos Pueblo and the Seed Savers Exchange, where Rowan White is the director of the board, um, grew out some of the seeds that are in their collections that are from indigenous communities, including this Taos squash that Henrietta is holding on to here. And so as part of the summit, that squash was brought back to the community and reintroduced and people welcomed it in. You can see she's kind of holding it like a baby and they're, they're welcoming it back into the community. Some other seed rematriation projects that um, have been undertaken. So as I mentioned, this was the Seed Savers Exchange for sending the, the Taos Pueblo squash home. Um, the Science Museum of Minnesota worked with the Upper Midwest Indigenous Seed Keepers Network. And this is um, Scott Shoemaker, who's from the Miami tribe, and he was a, a curator there at the time. And the Science Museum had a collection of seeds that was collected by um, an anthropologist in the 1930s and added into the collection. And um, in the, the 2000s, curators at the Science Museum decided to try to grow out some of those seeds and send them back to the communities that they were collected from. So that Dakota corn that you saw a few pages ago at the Dream of Wild Health Project came um, from these seeds that had been stored away on the shelves here. The University of Michigan is working with MACPRO, which is an organization of tribes in Michigan. Um, to try to grow out some of the seeds that are part of the collection here in this garden and then send them back to their, their home communities. The Hudson Valley Farm Hub, um, uh, working with Seed Shed with Ken Green here, has been collaborating with uh, Mohawk people from Okwazisni, so people like Rowan and Kenny you see in this photo, and they established the Native Seed Sanctuary, so using land that Mohawk people once farmed on hundreds of years ago, and rededicating that land to growing out Mohawk heirloom varieties of seed, including this red bread corn that's in the, the background part of the photo here. And then that seed um, has been sent back to Akwazosni for food and for seed. And then this is a, a, an ongoing project at the Field Museum with the Meskwaki tribe. So in 1907, William Jones, who was actually the first indigenous guy in the US to get a PhD in anthropology, he collected these seeds from the Meskwaki tribe and they went into the collections at the Field Museum um, and they kind of sat there for a hundred years without anybody thinking much about them. And now as part of a exhibit to redevelop the Native American Hall at the Field Museum, um, the story is coming out again. And so members of the Meskwaki tribe came up to the museum to visit with these seeds and then some were driven down. You see a um, curator here, Eli Sazakovich, who is from the Cree tribe. He helped to drive some of these seeds down to the Meskwaki community um, so that they could try to grow them out. Um, and so that's part of the broader um, movement of trying to um, send things home to their communities that they were collected from. <laughs> 
so then in thinking about you've got um, you know people getting these gardening projects going, there's an effort to try to bring home some of these seeds and get some of these traditional foods back out there. Um, how do you get people excited about eating this food again? And so this is where native chefs come in to part of this project um, and part of the effort to, you know, through these different food summits, through different catering businesses, to try to get people thinking about um, native culture and native food specifically. So when I've interviewed, I talked to about 30 different native chefs um, about, you know, what prompted them to want to be a chef that focuses on native food specifically. Why are they taking part in these different food summits? Um, part of it is cultural pride. So you know, really loving the foods from the communities where they're from and wanting to get fellow community members excited about that food, but also demonstrating to the, the broader outside world how beautiful these foods are. There's an interest in preserving food ways and techniques. As you can see, Arlie's here with a giant clay pot and working you know, over a fire. Um, not in a commercial kitchen in this setting. So thinking about how can these traditional styles of cooking be reincorporated as well. Um, there is just, you know, depending on where you guys are all from in the audience here, the likelihood is that there are not native food restaurants um, where you're from. So there's a real lack of representation of venues serving native cuisine, especially those that are run by native people. Um, and there's a real desire to want to encourage and inspire the community um, to want to eat foods and increase access to these healthy foods. So this is um, done through different community meals and training at events like the Great Lakes Intertribal Food Summit, um, the Native American Culinary Association conferences that Chef Nephi Craig has organized over the years. And through the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, a culinary mentorship program that helps to partner more senior chefs um, like Loretta Bear Odin you see down here, like Sean Sherman, with um, more junior chefs who are just learning about this um, new career choice. And so in thinking about gastro diplomacy or this idea of winning hearts and minds through stomachs. And so usually when people are writing about gastro diplomacy, they're talking about the introduction of you know, foreign cultures. So cultures that most people aren't that familiar with through cuisine, which is considered kind of a non-threatening way to introduce cuisine to people. And part of the hope through um, introducing people to cultures through cuisine is that it will enhance cultural understanding and cultural visibility. So here in California, where I am currently sitting on Ohlone territory as we speak, um, Cafe Ohlone run by um, Louis Trevino, you see here, and Vincent Medina um, was set up behind a bookstore in pre-COVID times. And part of what their goal was as part of this restaurant and part of through their ongoing um, catering business in Macomham, they focus exclusively on California foods um, that are indigenous to this landscape. And so in having these meals that people came to, they were not only fed all of these beautiful foods, but they also received an education about the history um, of what the Ohlone tribe and other California tribes have gone through as part of the colonization process. So people came for beautiful food. They got a long history of um, you know, the suffering that California tribes have gone through, but also the current efforts to reclaim language, to reclaim culture. And then at the end of the meal, so after people have, have heard all of this information, you, know, you see these brownies in the corner that are made out of acorn flour. And so then Vincent will come out and say, okay, you know, Lewis has made these amazing brownies, but before we give you dessert, understand that, you know, as part of being part of this meal and sitting at our table, um, you now have an obligation in going forward to correct people when you hear people say wrong things. So if people say, oh, California Indians used to speak their language or they used to have these foods, you now should correct them and say, no, no, we ate their food. It's really good. You know, we heard them speak their language. We've heard about these efforts. Um, and so it was sort of like, okay, you know, you'll get your dessert after you agree that um, you, you're going to be an ally to our community going forward. Um, similarly, the I Collective is a group of indigenous chefs from around the country that has done a number of different pop-up meals with the purpose of you know, bringing people in to have all this in beautiful indigenous food, but also as part of that, people get an education about 
um, different issues that are facing Native communities. And then part of what many of these Native chefs are working to do is to support these different Native producers. So this is Ben Jacobs, who runs Takabe in Denver. Um, he's from the Osage tribe. And part of their philosophy is that as much as possible, they buy their ingredients first from different Native food producers, and then whatever they can't source from Native folks, they get from other local farmers. So it's a way of providing a market for these different farming and gardening projects. And then so part of you know, ensuring that these foods can be grown, that these seeds can be grown, is making sure that um, water is kept clean and the environment that's necessary to produce these foods is kept clean. Um, so you know, anybody who's been part of any of these water protector movements has heard this chant of you can't drink oil, keep it in the soil. So thinking about where does and the environmental justice movement and the food sovereignty movement dovetail as part of you know, making sure that there's a clean environment for these foods. So for the Ponca tribe, that um, there's a Ponca tribe today in Oklahoma and a Ponca tribe in Nebraska. They've, everybody used to be in Nebraska and then the US Army rounded everybody up in the 1850s and forced people down to Oklahoma. Um, and you know, right before people were rounded up, they had planted their corn. So it was all in the ground, it was in the field. This is Amos Hinton, who previously ran the agriculture department for the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma. And he made it his mission to try to reclaim some of those corn varieties, to find corn varieties that had been left behind in the ground um, that people didn't have access to anymore for their fields. And so over the years, working with the Pawnee for some of the seeds that had been repatriated to them, but then also working with a corn breeder in Minnesota, they were able to bring back some of these seeds um, that people hadn't planted in a century. So here, this is an event that's been hosted every year by Bold Nebraska and the Cowboy and Indian Alliance on the Tanderup farm in Nebraska um, on land that the Ponca people had been driven off of by the army. And so every year now people come back and they plant the corn in the proposed path of the Keystone pipeline as a way of saying, you shall not pass. You're not gonna drive your bulldozers over our sacred corn that it took so long to get back. And a few summers ago, the Tanderup family deeded this land that the cornfield is on to the two Ponca tribes um, as a way of having now another landowner kind of in the way of the, the Keystone pipeline project. And then the Love Water Not Oil horseback rides that have been going on across Minnesota intended to draw attention to um, the different wild rice beds that would be negatively impacted by having a pipeline grow across the north. So wild rice is a very important cultural food um, to Anishinaabe people, to Dakota people, um, to anybody who's ever tried it. It's an amazing, delicious food. It's a very sensitive plant. And so there's been efforts to draw attention to that landscape in order to try to discourage those pipelines from going over the wild rice beds. And then um, the, the camps that were developed at Standing Rock, the Osheti Shikoi camps that people um, lived in for some time as a way of trying to stop that pipeline from going under the water source for the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. There were some native chefs like Brian Yazi, who you see here, with a, a tray full of buffalo burgers that went there specifically to try to make sure that people were eating healthy, that traditional foods were being served in the camp. Um, you see, this is me here with a, a bag of wild rice. So the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance raised some money and bought wild rice from um, the White Earth Tribe. And then Dan Cornelius drove it down his Subaru and we distributed it to the different kitchens that were feeding some of the water protectors there. So to, to kind of wrap up here, the, um, indigenous food sovereignty is a growing movement. So all of these projects that I talked to you about um, were are located in what is currently known as the United States of America, but there are indigenous people across the Western hemisphere and across the globe who are fighting for food sovereignty and to protect their seeds and protect their foods. So the pictures on the right are from um, a corn conference that was hosted in Tlaxcala, Mexico back in 2019 that was hosted by 
um, the International Indigenous Treaty Council and other organizations that brought people from different communities across the Western Hemisphere to talk about um, their challenges in preserving ancestral varieties of corn. And then the photo on the left is the Uchbanka Corn Conference that took place this past spring 2020 um, in Belize and brought together people from um, different villages in Belize and Guatemala, as well as indigenous folks from Canada and the US, again, to talk about the challenges of preserving heirloom corn and encouraging people to plant heirloom varieties of foods. So to kind of further conclude, um, you know, these heritage seeds, these different heirloom varieties, native varieties, indigenous varieties are part of the, the culture, part of agriculture. They're an important part of maintaining health in communities, an important part of cultural and physical resilience, um, and an important part of indigenous cuisine more broadly. And so this is part of what is motivating people to continue to seek out and plant and nurture these varieties. And part of what I've been trying to get across is that effort to protect these seeds goes beyond you know, just being anti-science or anti-infrastructure, um, that people really value these seeds as living relatives, as important aspects of culture and don't wanna see them tampered with and don't wanna see the land where they're planted um, contaminated by oil. There's an importance to the rematriation part of the seed sovereignty effort. Um, so bringing these seeds home from different institutions where they've been held for a while is an integral part of this seed sovereignty movement here. Um, and there's also an opportunity for the mending, creating and restoring of relationships between settler people and settler organizations and indigenous communities through these food sovereignty projects. So through um, sending seeds home, bringing seeds home, giving land back as part of this food sovereignty movement. And, you know, importantly, the clean environment is integral to the food and seed sovereignty movement. So I thank you for listening. Um, here, if you want to read a little bit more that I've written about these issues, this is a blog post and an article that I did about how some of these food systems have been impacted by COVID. Um, this is a book that I co-edited with Devon Mahesua about indigenous food sovereignty in the United States that brings together um, farmers and seed keepers and fisher people and professors and lawyers and public health people all talking about um, what food sovereignty means to them and how people are advancing toward that. And so here is my email. If people have any questions, I'm at elizabeth.hoover at berkeley.edu. And I look forward to chatting with you during the question and answer period.